Good morning, everyone. Uh, excuse me, my Spanish is a little dangerous, so I'm going to stick with English up here, uh, or some form of English. So I work for Sandstorm Gold, and this is a is a big is a very different talk than what you've been hearing. Um, I know this conference is about discoveries, and, and discoveries are what drive the whole business, and geologists make discoveries. Um, I'm a geologist, but I work for a finance company, and uh, we're going to talk today about uh, some of the different aspects of financing for these types of projects. Um, my job at Sandstorm is to, uh, I work with a team of three people. We do technical due diligence, and our job is to evaluate the, uh, the various companies that we provide financing for. Uh, this is our lovely forward-looking statement, which uh, it's small enough, I hope you can read it. Um, there will be some forward-looking statements, guaranteed. Um, next slide, please. So today I hope to touch on a few things. Um, talk a little bit about finance concepts, mainly streams and royalties. Uh, I don't mean to offend anyone, but a lot of places I go, it's kind of an unusual concept. Uh, separately, give a little bit of a review of Sandstorm Gold, and then talk about our partners, some of our partners. Um, we consider any investment company we work with to be a partner, and um, that's part of the uh, strategy we consider unique for Sandstorm. And then lastly, talk a little bit about our recent acquisitions and the, some of the new companies we've created. So, next slide. Uh, yeah, so talking about the finance concepts, um, there are two main types of, uh, next slide please, uh, there are two main types of financings that we're involved with. Um, there's a, we're a precious metals company, so gold streaming is, uh, is our main business, and um, the way gold streaming works is we make a contract with a company to buy future production at a discounted rate. So there's an upfront cash payment. But then once the production occurs, we make us another payment, a fixed cost payment, usually on the order of three or $400 an ounce. So streaming has two levels of payment. But in the royalty space, we also purchase royalties. Royalty space is usually for a small portion of future production, usually on the order of one to 2%. There's a one-time payment, and then we get our payback from production in the future. There's no additional payment. So those are the two main um, types of financing we're involved with, and I'll talk about some of those uh, activities next. Uh, importantly, um, the difference between this type of financing and conventional financing, uh, conventional financing, equity, debt, that sort of thing, um, you have some control on your payback. Uh, debt, you have a control on the asset. Equity, you can sell your stock. But with a royalty or a stream, the only way you get paid is if there's production. So the technical due diligence is critical. You have to make sure that what you're buying is going to come out of the ground, and, uh, and so it's a much higher risk. Next slide. So um, interestingly, uh, uh, the types of financing vary by the stage of a project commonly in, in the finance business. So this slide shows the different stages of a project. Um, We've got uh, in the beginning generative, followed by what I call the discovery stage. This is where the Lasson curve kicks in. And then um, resource drilling, development, and production. And uh, the different types of financing that are common here, equity on top and debt on the bottom. And what we see is that commonly um, equity is is at every stage of a project, and sometimes it's mixed in with other types of debt, but separately, uh, royalties. Um, rarely do you see royalty purchases in a generative program. It, it does happen, but uh, usually it's at the discovery phase or at the resource drilling phase, and then occasionally in the development stage. Um, it's kind of unusual to sell a royalty when you're in production because the visibility of the value is very, very clear there. Uh, then lastly, um, streaming is a more mature type of financing. Usually it's reserved for the development stage of a project where you can actually make a model of what the production is going to look like and justify your purchase. And then separately, uh, in production, it's, it's more common. And uh, conventional debt is generally reserved for more mature projects for mine construction and mine expansion, much larger amounts of monies. Interestingly, streaming, streaming has um, replaced a lot of the conventional debt methods, um, largely because it has a lower cost of capital, 
Uh, and I'm not sure I can say this, but it's, it's another form of off-balance sheet debt. So if a company is overloaded with debt, this is one mechanism to acquire additional money if needed. Next slide. Uh, so this, um, I'd like to describe a little bit of, about the royalty and streaming companies. Um, in the last decade, there's been an explosion in these types of companies. There are 22 companies listed in the Toronto Exch Exchange now. And uh, that's, what was I going to say here? Um, yeah, so the streaming finance has grown largely by replacing um, conventional debt. But the question comes, well, how does a streaming company get its money? And there are generally three types of uh, companies. There are companies that are born, and these are companies where large mining companies or moderate-sized mining companies spin out their royalties on the properties they own and they throw in a pile of cash. And that's the case for Franco Nevada and also uh, Osisco. And the second type is what we call an organic growth where a company just starts up and acquires royalties and raises money to buy these royalties through conventional methods, usually equity or debt. Uh, and then Oop, sorry. The third type of um, approach is to actually create your own royalties, and this is done with exploration companies. Uh, some exploration companies acquire properties, explore them, make discoveries, and then they extract the royalty and then sell the property. And a case for that is uh, Altius Minerals and uh, EMX Royalties. So, next slide. Um, now I'd like to take a look at the, uh, the top five uh, largest um, or six largest um, streaming companies. And uh, there's a lot of information on this. I'll try to keep it simple, but um, they basically consist of Franco Nevada, uh, Wheat and Precious Metals, Royal Gold. These are the top three. And we look at the companies through their market cap. And the market cap is tied to the number of properties they have, the number of producing properties they have, and the number of ounces they produce. So there's a very linear relationship there. Um, Franco uh, has market cap north of 30 billion. Um, they've up over 400 properties and 113 are producing. And then they have 728,000 of production, 728,000 ounces of production last year. Uh, wheat and precious metals not too far behind, but. Uh, they have a much lower number of properties. Um, they have 35 properties and 21 are producing, and they produced about 750,000 ounces. And Royal Gold's right in there, about half the size of Wheaton. And then there are three companies down here that are all in the 2 to $3 billion stage. Um, that's where Sandstorm sits, and that, these numbers are from September 22nd, so they, they've changed a lot. But, uh, and it is interesting to note, you know, Wheaton, or sorry, Franco at 728,000 ounces up here, and Sandstorm down here at 67,000 ounces. Uh, there's quite a big gap in production. But interestingly, Sandstorm has the second largest number of properties and the second largest number of producing properties. And that'll be the subject of some of the next couple slides. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, so Sandstorm's been on a pretty strong growth curve since about 2010. We started at this point in time, we had five investments, royalties and streams, and now we're up to 250. Um, there was aggressive growth from 2014 to 2018. So uh, we, we seek to continue this trend in order to capitalize on the, uh, the production rate, as I just alluded to. Currently, we have, as I say, 250 in total, 39 producers we've invested in, 30 in development, 24 in advanced development, and then we have 157 exploration projects. And um, that's kind of why we're here. We, uh, we recognize that that's where deposits come from. So next slide, please. We're globally diversified. You can see we've got projects on every continent. Mainly, we're in the Americas, though, uh, with most of our production coming from uh, North and South America. Uh, next slide. And we're mainly a precious metals company with 88% of our total gold equivalent ounces coming in gold and silver. We've got 81% in gold, 7% in silver, 
8% in copper, mainly out of South America. And um, we also have this other thing called Other, which is actually a diamond. So <laughs> we have a royalty up in, uh, in Diavec up in Canada. So, next slide, please. I think one of the things Sandstorm does well is we, we focus on the companies and we focus on the drilling because drilling drives everything. And this slide shows the annual cumulative drilling on the portfolio that we've invested in. And you can see that uh, you know, in the early years here, it was not huge, but now we're up to about 626,000 meters of drilling on, on our portfolio. That's, uh, that's evenly split between uh, production properties and exploration and development properties. So uh, this is a, a good metric to demonstrate uh, the benefit of A, investing in companies that can drill, and B, properties that have expansion potential. Have the next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, to that point, this slide demonstrates the recent history, the amount of production we've we've come up with on the, in the gold bars compared to the amount of ounces that were discovered from that drilling, and you can see each year the the amount of ounces replaces the production, and it also exceeds that production, so that these projects are growing, the resources are growing, and the development projects are growing. So. Uh, this is a very favorable metric, but again, it ties back to looking at properties with good upside potential. Next slide, please. Uh, Sandstorm's been on a pretty, pretty big tear recently, uh, acquiring new projects, and, and also the cumulative effect of acquiring all these exploration projects. As they go through the pipeline, they, they start to produce, and so. This slide shows the historic gold production from our portfolio, and now we've projected what we anticipate to be the additional production up to 2025. Uh, this reflects both maturing projects and recent acquisitions. So we're looking at approximately 90% increase in production in the next three years. Next slide. And if we compare that to our peer group, we believe we're, we're greatly ahead of uh, the rest of the pack in terms of our, uh, our phase of uh, expansion. And uh, this slide shows the relative percentage increase in gold production for our peers as well as Sandstorm. So we're looking at uh, 2025 having a pretty good year. Next slide. So Sandstorm prides itself on working with its partners. And um, as I indicated earlier, partners are the people we invest with. So I thought I'd give an example of a couple of, uh, couple of cases um, that are, they're not garden variety cases, but they demonstrate the, the concept uh, favorably. First, we'll look at the hot modern gold copper project, which is in the Tethian belt in Eastern Turkey. Uh, and then I'll take a quick look at um, the Arizona gold deposit in uh, Brazil. Next slide. So Hot Modern is a, it's a pretty unusual deposit. Um, it's located in northeast Turkey in the, uh, the Pontides, uh, in the Tethian Belt, as I mentioned. And it's, um, it started life as a VMS, but it's really part of an epithermal porphyry type environment. And, uh, and that's been changed a bit. Next slide, please. Oh. I should, it's hard to read from over here, but the, uh, our partner here is Lydia Madoncelic. Uh, they have a 70% operating interest. We have a 2% NSR, and we also have a 30% interest in the project, which I'll describe. Um, what else? And this is a development stage project. We expect production to start in 2025. So, slides, please. The history on this project uh, actually dates back to the Roman Empire, but um, we're not going to go that far back. For Sandstorm, it started in 2015. Um, uh, to some degree of sadness, uh, that year Tech Resources uh, had to sell their royalty portfolio, and they sold all their royalties into three batches, and uh, we bid on one batch that had uh, 52 royalties, including a 2% NSR on Hot Modern. And we were successful in acquiring that, that uh, package for uh, total price was $19 million. Um, and it's interesting because tech took all of, all of the value in stock. And within two years, that stock had appreciated about 500%. So the purchase price looks a lot better than the sale price, or the ultimate value is a lot better than the sale price. Um, and then in 2017, well, at the time, 
we acquired the royalty, the project was already in a joint venture, 70-30 joint venture, where Lydia, the large Turkish conglomerate, had uh, earned into 70% from a UK-based uh, junior, Mariana Resources. And so, recognizing the value of the property, Sandstorm made a friendly gesture to Mariana, and uh, we ended up acquiring the property, uh, the company for $175 million. So we bought that 30% interest for another $175 million. And then we have been working with Lydia and have recently pre cre uh, completed a feasibility study 2021 where the NPV5 um, post-tax is about $1.05 billion. So we're, we're kind of excited about this project. And uh, now I'd like to try to tell you a little bit about the, the, the geology of the property. So this is a, it's an easy story to tell, but it's embarrassing. Um, so we have a billion dollar project here, and we have very little geology. Um, the geology that's been published in all these wonderful 43 101s are extremely pr preliminary. Um, so I'll tell you what I can tell you with confidence, but this is an unusual deposit, and it has a lot to be learned here. But what it boils down to is um, it's hosted in Cretaceous Volcanics, and the eastern side of the project is, is mainly subaerial volcanics. The western side is mainly shallow marine sedimentary rocks. And there's a north-south trending structural zone that, it, that, that it tra traverses the entire property here, but um, the main deposits are located right here. There's actually only one deposit with resources, uh, significant resources and reserves, and that's the, the main zone here. And then there's another zone in the literature here known as the southern zone. The geology is totally different between the two. The alteration is different. The grades are different. But as you'll see, there's a long way to go with this. Uh, I'm going to show you a slide um, with a photograph taken from here looking north. Next slide, please. Oh, ac no, that's, that's fine. Actually, could you go back one? Sorry. This image over, oops. Avance, hold for one. This, no, there was an image that showed these uh, alteration scar, forward, forward. Avance, por favor. Okay, aquí, por favor. This is a, uh, an image showing the alteration scar as it traverses the property and the location of the two zones that have been identified. And uh, now we'll take a look at the region from a position right about here. This is what's called the old Russian workings. Again, uh, not very specific term. It looks like it's an extremely altered high sulfidation uh, system hosted within a rhyodacidic pyroclastic sequence with abundant uh, quartz energite veinlets sticking out of the ground. But for now, we'll just call it the Russian system. Uh, next slide, please. So, this is what the scar looks like running up to the, to the north, and the main deposit sits right in here. Um, the discovery hole was 103 meters of nine grams gold and 2% copper from 23 meters depth. So you're in the bottom of the valley. The deposit is very close to the surface. You go north, the terrain goes higher. You go south, the terrain goes higher. And, and I think there's uh, certainly a lot of uh, potential to look at at depth there. Next slide, please. Uh, these are simplified cross-sections, as I alluded to earlier. What we see in a cross-section regional scale is there's about a 300-meter-wide zone of uh, dominantly chloritic alteration that's been logged as propolitic. Then we have what's been called argillic alteration, but we don't have any real spectral data on the mica compositions. But uh, uh, my bet is that we're seeing a lot of sericite in there, a lot of quartz sericite pyrite type alteration. And then there's a parallel zone of uh, what I call QSP. And the main zone is a vertical zone. The alteration, clearly bounded by vertical structures. This structural zone has been reactivated multiple times, and uh, it's clearly um, a complicated story. But uh, the, the main deposit here has been drilled to about 450 meters. And I didn't mention it, but the, 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 the billion ounce uh, uh, reserve is about 300 meters north-south within an eight kilometer long alteration zone. So it's very early in the, in, the alt, in the studies here. Again, here's a detailed look at that somewhat uh, simplified zoning of the alteration. Um, this is a bad uh, body of high-grade uh, calcopyrite pyrite with gold. 
Uh, that's main, the purple is mainly massive pyrite. And then this slide shows the distribution of um, the main deposit. But there's also, uh, again, polyphase mineralization. These are structurally controlled sphalerite zones that kick up about a percent of zinc. Um, I don't know how that fits into the story, but it's certainly uh, important. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are some of the rock types we have. Um, the upper left is the main ore type. This is uh, what we call our chloritic volcanic uh, with QSP alteration, and that assay is 55 grams per ton gold. Um, this is the same rock with the type two alteration or mineralization. It's cut by banded jasper veins, uh, evidence of reactivation. Uh, and even that banded vein is cut by a younger pure quartz phase. And that, that material runs about uh, 33 grams per ton gold. And then the main attraction is the brecciated massive sulfide. Part of this body is, is, a, ma is a massive sulfide by, by definition, more than 22% sulfide but not a VMS. And um, it, this particular breccia has been cemented with second phase of, of sulfide and uh, carries an average grade of 25 grams gold and 5% copper. And then lastly, uh, a different version of the brecciated mass of sulfide. In this case, it's been, um, the matrix has been replaced with quartz and uh, anhydrite, which complicates matters. Uh, next slide, please. So the reserve here uh, in the feasibility study is a proven and probable reserve about 8.7 million tons at 8.8 .8 grams, 1.5% copper, um, 2.5 million ounces of gold. Uh, next slide, please. And I mentioned the feasibility study. Uh, the pre-tax uh, NPV is about 1.3 billion. That's with a 5% discount and the post-tax 1.05 billion. And the all-in sustaining cash costs on a byproduct basis, we're running at about $334 an ounce. So once this thing's up and running, it's going to be a cash cow. Next slide, please. And then next, uh, take a look at uh, another project, this one in Brazil. This is the Arizona Gold, uh, Arizona gold Mine. Um, next slide, please. Uh, located here right on the north coast of Brazil. This is the eastern extension of the Guyana Shield, and a lot of people like to say it's also the western extension of the Burman Greenstone Belt in Africa, but either way, it's, it's, it's consistent with the geology. It's mainly a volcanic sequence with uh, uh, lesser set, uh, sedimentary rocks and intruded by quartz diorite bodies. Um, here, clearly see the variation between the surface oxidation and the, the pit now getting into some of the um, less oxidized and unoxidized rocks. And that, this plays a, an important part of the story. Uh, this is a recent mill that's been constructed. And, uh, and this is an example of the mineralization. This would be the quartz diorite ho hosted stockwork mineralization of the orogenic type as we <laughs> like to generalize. Uh, our partner here is Equinox Gold, and uh, we have a slide and scale royalty, three to five percent based on the price of gold. Um, next slide, please. I've lost my timer here. I'm wondering how we're doing for time. Um, but uh, the Arizona history, it goes way back before us, obviously, but we got involved in 2009, and this is, again, an example of how Sandstorm can be a, a reasonable partner to work with. Um, we purchased a 17% life of mine gold stream here. Uh, the resource was 21 million tons at about 1.3 grams for 800,000 ounces of gold. Uh, we paid 17 million in a loan, 5.5 million in shares, and then we agreed to pay an additional $400 per ounce on every ounce of production. And the goal here was to give them money to build the mine. So the, the mine was built, and in uh, 2011, um, our investment was with Luna Gold. And Luna Gold declared commercial production um, in 2011, and later that year, they expanded their resource by 250%. So that looked pretty good. Um, 2014, however, things uh, started to go wrong. We were having some trouble with the mill. The mill was built for soft ore, and we were running out of soft ore. Um, there are other features that come involved with that. I won't go into that now, but um, bottom line is they ran out of ore, 
And so uh, Sandstorm ste stepped up um, and we provided a $10 million loan initially. And then after the mine had shut, um, we restructured our entire finance package. We converted the 17% stream to two royalties, uh, the variable scale royalty on the mine production and then some adjacent royalties. Uh, we extended the term on our, our loan, our original loan, and then we also issued a convertible debenture for $30 million. And so that helped the mine get up and running. And then with a, a lot of uh, wheeling and dealing, um, Luna merged in 2017, Luna merged with JDL Copper to create Trek Mining, and then Trek merged with Newcastle and Anfield Gold to create Equinox Gold. And then in 2019, Equinox declared commercial production, and we got back in business, and we've been reasonably successful ever since then. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is the regional geology. I mentioned it briefly. You can see it just sits, this Menandoc of, um, of Sao, uh, Sao Jose Craton sitting out in the uh, alluvial covered coastal plains of Brazil. Not much to see there. Next slide, please. Uh, but once on the property, you can see the mineralization is associated with shear zones and these tonalitic intrusives, and there are numerous targets on the property, but the main production comes from three areas, uh, the Piaba pit uh, here, which is the one we started off with, and then the Tarajuba, and then the Bao Esperanca. But this is what we like to see as a, as a target-rich environment, lots of upside potential, and uh, you can see this slide here gives you an example of the style of mineralization. They started as an open pit mine, and then as pit geometries uh, diminished and the metallurgy changed, it's converting these lower resources into underground, underground mining. Next slide, please. So uh, the resources in Arizona, they're broken into five deposits, but what it boils down to is the total M&I for the underground and open pit it stands now at about 18 million tons at one and a half grams and 860,000 ounces of gold. So, next slide, please. So, um, that's sort of an example of what we try to do and work with our partners in a reasonable way, but uh, we've been doing a lot of other business as well. And um, this year, uh, since the beginning of the year, we, we mobilized $1.1 billion in, in uh, in money in various forms and we acquired two different transactions um, we've got uh, we purchased the nomad royalty company here and back in june and then we also purchased a portfolio of royalties from glencore shown here um, so the goal here was to increase our our production value and, and that also ties into a more interesting story um, if i can have the next slide please um, as a result of this transaction, we extracted all of our, our major copper assets and put it into a company called Horizon Copper. So this is intended to be a significant copper producing company. We took our hot modern project, put that copper gold deposit into that company, and then extracted the gold through a gold uh, streaming agreement so that Sandstorm remains a pure large gold producer and Horizon Copper will continue to be uh, a very significant copper producer. And the point to this story is the next slide, please. And as another part of that, you can see Sandstorm's grown now. We're going to be a you know, multi-billion dollar company with significant production. The bigger a company gets, the less interest they have in small projects. And what Sandstorm's done is in taken their smaller royalties and put them into another new company, which is called Sandbox. And Sandbox is a, a joint operation between uh, Equinox as, as an ox and Sandstorm. And so we now put all of our remaining royalties into this company. This company is going to be funded, looking for new opportunities for royalties and streaming throughout the world. And we're looking for new investment opportunities. And that's why we're here to see you. So thank you.